should be lucky to get a scoliosis case in your exam. First of all, a lot of sympathy from the examiners. First of all, it's going to be rare. Most importantly, the diagnosis is never in doubt. Okay, is there anybody over here who needs a scoliosis in clinical examination? Right? So, what you need to understand is how to approach the case in terms of assessment and the basic understanding of the management. Even if you tell this much, I am quite sure you will be able to pass. Do not try to go too much into detail. I am sure quite a few of you, most of the institutes nowadays are exposed to scoliosis surgeons. But do not fall into the jargon what spine surgeons tend to use. Because the more you will talk, you will invite more and more patients. Right? So, anyone of you, can you tell me the X-ray diagnosis over here? Yes, tell me. Anybody? I mean, I just ask you, is this something in doubt? Just tell me the extra diagnosis. Yes, but what about the scoliosis? That is the only diagnosis. Yes? Is it left sided? What, what tells you it's left and right? No, there is something written over there. Right? There is something over here. Alright, so this is left sided, what scoliosis? Region of the spine? This is dorsal lumbar area. What is dorsal lumbar part of the spine? From which segment to which segment? So is this, you look at the apex. What is the apex of a curve? The midpoint. So this is the curve, the midpoint. Maximally tilted, right? Or, or let's say this vertebra is the apex. So this is what? This is thoracic lumbar? Thoracic, right sided thoracic, correct? Is this the only curve that you see? So how do you know this is compensatory and this is not compensatory? So you understand? First and foremost, every scoliosis has how many terms of the X-rays? No, there are three. Look here. From here onwards, do you think this is perfectly normal? No. Understood? So, for the person to remain straight and he has a curve, there has to be something compensatory above and below. Without that, he will not stand straight, right? So, the body has a capacity to compensate. When that gets exhausted, still it will be visible. Are the shoulders at one level? Yes. The eye is at one level. It is not at one level, right? So, if you have to really comment on this X-ray, there is a major curve, looks like more than 40 degrees, which is a right thoracic, compensatory left lumbar, also cervical thoracic. Understood, first thing you understand that every scoliosis has other curves as well. Correct? So let's go into little detail. What is scoliosis? Everybody knows about this. But is it just lateral curvature? What are the other components of deformation of a spine in scoliosis? Rotation and there is also change in the sagittal curvature. It cannot remain the same. What are the normal sagittal curvatures? Thoracic kyphosis, lumbar lordosis, also cervical lordosis, right? So, if you really want to describe a deformation of spine, you need to comment on all three. Coronal change is scoliosis, sagittal change is either kyphosis, lordosis, hypolordosis, hyperlordosis, hyperkyphosis, all those things, plus how much of rotation. And what is it that tells you about the rotation? When you look at a person, how do you know there is a lot of rotation? Correct. So, when you look at a person who has come with something, first it starts with the history, the complaints. And what is the commonest complaint of a person with scoliosis? It is not back pain, it is not neurological, it is the observation of deformation. Usually it occurs when the shoulders or the waist starts tilting, patient has apparent limb discrepancy, or accidentally mother or somebody has seen also a screening program which you don't have over here, but a deformity. Now, many a times, it is not the deformity of spine, but something else. Deformity of the rib, chest, or in girls, inequality of the breast, or something like that. So, actually the main problem is in the spine, but the other things get deformed as well, leading to trunk asymmetry. Now, there are cases where the patient may have back pain, because of biomechanical fatigue. But whenever a scoliosis comes with a lot of back pain or a lot of radicular pain, what do you need to suspect? There could be some associated condition. Is there any condition which is extremely painful and given as to scoliosis? 
Hey man, you've been listening to the last few talks. <laughs> Psychic list. What is the commonest cause? A painful disc. So anything which causes pressure on the root, even if it is not disc, can it give rise to scoliosis? It can. On examination and x-ray, we want to find out whether it is a structural curve or is it a compensatory curve. But anything is called a scoliosis. Understood? Osteoidoscoma is a very good. But it is not that common. Do you remember what Sanjay told you? Rare things you should mention most rarely. So, anything which causes pressure on the nerve can give rise to that also. Now, are there any other conditions which can lead to scoliosis? In pediatric age group, the commonest? Yes. So, neuromuscular <coughs> paralytic, <coughs> congenital deformations, right? So, here also there are lots of things that you need to see on the x ray to find out the etiology of the condition. Right? Now the history can give you a clue as regards the presence of the reason or the type of scoliosis. What you need to ask is the consanguinity. Why do you ask for consanguinity? Anybody? Is there any other diagnosis, a short case that you ask for consanguinity? You have a pediatric deformity in the limbs. Do you ask for consanguinity history? Why? You like to go into family details. Pardon? Yes. So, there is something which is hereditary, something which is transmitted, could be autosomal link, but there could be something which is not at all known to be genetically transmitted, but it is familial. What is familial incidence without a hereditary gene? If you have it in the family, there are higher chances of developing it. For an example, hypertension, diabetes, rheumatoid, there is no gene which is localized or isolated so far, but you know if the sibling has it, there are higher chances that the other sister or brother will have it. Alright? So there are only few things what you need to understand. What is the other history you will ask? There are associated other anomalies. <coughs> Why do you need to ask that? For an example, if somebody has uh, calcaneous deformation, you ask for something regarding spine. Why? Syndromic condition. Associated difficulties, neuromuscular problems. So all this will come as a group and it helps you to understand what it could be. Most importantly, you have to ask for progression. When was the first time it was found out? Is it progressive? How it was found out? Since the onset, has it increased the most important vital information for the treatment also? And if it is beforehand diagnosed, what is the treatment taken so far? When it comes to assessment, it is very obvious that the patient has deformation, but there is a systematic way you need to diagnose and present to the examiner. Now, scoliosis examination completely divided into examination of the spine as a musculoskeletal system, examination of the neurology, the CMS, radical symptoms, everything, then also the patient as a whole. So, right from the patient's uh, nutritional status, height, all these things will matter. Okay, so all three things do not forget. I will tell you the importance of general examination a little later on. So, when you patient uh, have an evaluation of the patient, all these things have to be noted and included in your presentation. Most important thing in the observation is you examine the patient behind, from behind, in all positions, standing, sitting, bending forward, walking, supine, prone, lateral also. And what are the things you look for? Obviously, the imbalance. The imbalance is noted by the shoulders, iliac crest, the curvature of the spine, the limb lengths, associated anomalies also you need to check. Right? So whenever you comment, you comment like this. Okay? The neckline, chest asymmetry, look at the scapula, look at the shoulders, look at the arms, look at the posterior iliac spines, right? And other things. Now there are something specific. Always comment on Adam's forward bending test. This is the gold standard. Why? Why Adam's forward bending test? Anybody? Sometimes, the, you know, the child is chubby. You may not know. Second, the rib hum becomes more obvious when you bend forward. Okay? So when you look from behind, around 90 degrees forward bending, you see clearly inequality of the two halves of the chest. Right? This is what is clearly seen. Okay. Now, the other thing what you have to see is the flexibility of the curve, the lateral bending. That also tells you something very important. 
Now there is some instrument called as coleometer. You can actually apply it in binding forward position and see, right? So all these things you try to measure. How much is the scoliosis? Whether it's getting corrected on bending, and you mention the associated conditions. Now also it might tell you whether there is any muscle spasm. You can see the muscles becoming very taut and forward bending sometimes is extremely painful. Mention that there are very few conditions. What you see when you see the patient in the lateral profile or side profile, you mention all these, right? Here, the shoulder, the thoracic curvature, the neck curvature, lumbar spine, tightness of the hamstring, the patient, how she's walking, the pelvic obliquity from behind, but limb length measurements, all this have to be mentioned. Lying down position, it could be supine, it could be prone. These things you have to see. The neurology, limb length discrepancy, and in prone position, the spine is unloaded, then you see the difference when the patient was standing and difference when the patient is lying prone. It might get correct if the shoulder may become equal. Right? So that is also very valuable information. And actually you try to hyper extend and uh, see the push tone position that it is getting corrected. Okay? There are associated conditions. I will not go into detail of it. But when it is neuromuscular syndromic condition, there could be something very, very specific. Like lumbar spasticity, <coughs> hyper laxity of the joints, and so many other things, and syndromic conditions like Marfan's and all that. Fortunately, this is not expected unless it's very obvious. And he may just mention there are associated anomalies. Patient could have a syndromic condition. Don't include here. Now, as a patient, as a whole, why do you need to examine? You have to see the sexual maturity. Why do you need to see this? Why? The potential for growth. Potential for growth is indicated either from the skeleton through radiology or clinically the patient tells you. For an example, the history of puberty in a girl. You know that most of the girls, they are commonly having scoliosis compared to the boys. If they have already menarche and they do not have, the importance is different. If the menarche has already not occurred, that means when it occurs, suddenly there is going to be growth spot. So suddenly there is going to be increase in the scoliosis. Already the curve has reached a certain dimension. We expect the curve to grow a lot. So we will be vigilant, we will be watching it closely and that is the patient who will require a more aggressive treatment. Understood? So try to mention sinus cream, okay? Do not disrobe the patient and do all this if it is not comfortable, but mention in your examination that sinus cream or patient has achieved, uh, you know, menarche already. Now coming to the x-rays. Anybody, what are the x-rays that we usually advise for scoliosis? Don't read and tell me. Patient comes to you, let's say a three-year-old child. <coughs> Very mild scoliosis. What are the extras you'll advise? Three-year-old. I'm sure some of you cannot hang yourself on a bar just now if I ask you. Three-year-olds can't. Why am I asking that? If you start taking too many extras at three years, three and a half years, four years, four and a half years, every six months, he changes the doctor, he repeats. You know how much the radiological exposure? There has been a very good paper from UK which says 19% higher incidence of malignancy in some of these patients by the time they become adult. Okay? So stick to what you need. Usually a standing AP film is all that you need unless the scoliosis is already very high. Okay? Usually, if it is visible, diagnosis is not in doubt. You just need to measure. Second, if it is flexible, you don't have to take flex. Bending films also, okay? Every six months also stick to the same. The only thing is, if you want to classify by the newer system by lengthy, then you need AP standing lateral of the whole spine. AP standing, bending, or fulcrum bending. Understood? So four views minimum. Clear? On follow-up examination, examiner asks you, what will you do six months down the line? You will just repeat only AP standing whole spine. You will not keep on repeating everything. There is no role. Okay? Now the patient requires surgery, suppose. That is the time you are justified to repeat all four because it helps you to plan your surgery. Am I clear? The examiner asks you after your assessment, what are the investigations? I will do X-ray, this, 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 this. Depending on the age of the patient, severity, whether follow-up or indicated or not, then the others. 
other than x rays, anything else you will do? Why am I right? Every patient of scoliosis is subject to MRI. Why will you do? So what is camogram? What does it tell you in scoliosis? With neurological deficit. MRI. Let him say, scanogram what is the role in scoliosis? There is no role. Okay? Lower limbs, do they have anything to tell you in scoliosis? No. Tell me, neurology, what are you talking about neurology? Any spinal dysrhythm associated. Alright. So does the X ray tell you or only uh, MRI? MRI tell you. Does spinal dysrhythm can be seen on X ray as well? Any twisted cord associated? That's a different. Okay? If it is, let's say, something to do with the skeletal element, first of all, you will assess, you will see. The right answer to your question, I will give you in a short while. Anything else that you want to talk about X-rays? There are a few things, right? Now, see, why do you take X-ray in study in detail? Because you want to mention from where to where. We talked about right-sided thoracic curve. In examination, you need to see whether it is from D2 or D3, whether ending on L1 or L2 or L3. So you need to understand certain things. You need to mention about rotation. You also need to mention about certain other parameters as well, right? So you need to study detail. So how do you measure the scoliosis? Cobb's angle. What is Cobb's angle? Angle between this and this. <laughs> but what do you say? And what do you say? So the first question examiner is going to ask you, what is invertebra? Everybody is clear what is invertebra? You are not clear. This is something very distinct from any other case in orthopedics that here you are expected to understand certain terminologies, right? So try to understand this. As I told you, there is a major curve, there is a compensatory curve, maybe a third curve. This N vertebra is the maximum tilted vertebra. The one which is superior is the superior N vertebra. Maximally tilted, not maximally away. Okay? So if you see from here, horizontal, slightly tilted, little more, little more, little more, maximum, again less, 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 horizontal at apex, again inverse, converse direction, again, so it's the inferior N vertebra, superior. Superior end plate of superior N vertebra, inferior end plate of inferior N vertebra, the smaller angle between them. Clear? Same way, this is also the end vertebra for this curve. So this same angle or from here and from here will denote the lower compensatory curves measurement. Clear so far? End vertebra, Cobb's angle. Stick to this. There are other methods of perversion all not expected from you. Okay? Now there are other things also. What are neutral vertebra? Anybody? This is the end vertebra, correct? This is the end vertebra. But what is this? Neutral. Or both pedicles equal. End plates parallel. Not tilted, not rotated, not involved in the curve at all. Neutral. When you go up, maximum tilted end vertebra. And what is stable vertebra? The plumb line will dissect it. This. Okay? These three are different. Clear so far? Now, whenever we want to measure, there is also something called as CSVL, Central Sacral Vertical Line. Because you measure this distance, how much away from the midline. So midline is not arbitrary. We have a midline of the sacrum. If C7 we draw a plumb line, that is Central Sacral Vertical Line. So we also measure the shift from the CSVL. We see the tilt. We see the cross angle and we also see the rotation. Now there are methods of rotation. Right? There is Nash and Moe, Cobb's method, methods RV, AD. Okay, we should be proud of somebody in Indian who has described this. This rib angle is basically the long axis of the rib, vertical, small. Now what is the importance of this? A very low RV, AD gives higher potential for progression of the curve as well. So if you have a scoliosis in children, this is also a very important measurement, not just for rotation, but having the potential growth in future. Okay? So just remember this. First, how do you see the, this is the equality of the pedicle shadows? This starts rotating. The maximum rotation you will have easiest This. Okay? So again, what is a tilt? 
one is a shift from midline and the third is a rotation. This you can see on the X-rays only. Okay? Now the second thing what you have to see is not a parallel alignment but a sagittal alignment. Normally thoracic kyphosis, lumbar lordosis, most of the idiopathic scoliosis curves are lordosis scoliosis. What you see clinically as a kyphosis is actually different. So, okay? so what is normal thoracic kyphosis? Up to 40 degrees, normal lumbar lordosis, 20 to 40 degrees, so they compensate each other, and there is a cervical lordosis also. Anything which goes above, hyper, less, lower, when thoracic kyphosis goes negative, it becomes a lordoscoliosis. Clear so far? So, you need to mention about scoliotic curve, invertebrae, neutral vertebrae if required, the rotational potential, clinically by rib hump. On X-ray, also the sagittal profile, right? Now, something more that you have to see on the X-ray to judge the progression of the curve or potential is skeletal maturity. Now, this all of you know in orthopedics. What are the different ways of skeletal maturity, skeletal growth potential that you have to see? Hand X-ray, this, and biceps grading. I will not go into detail. I hope you know it. So, when you say the history of menarche, secondary sexual characters, we also need to mention this to say that there is so much skeletal potential there. Now, why do you do the MRI? There is a clear cut reason. Clinically, instead of a right curve, there is a left curve. It's very rigid. It's not flexible. It is extremely rigid. A lot of rotational alignment. There are some signs in the lower limbs, upper limbs, which may indicate some neurological involvement. Or it's a very rapidly <coughs> progressive curve. Early onset scoliosis. Very young person, but very high curve. These are definite signs to indicate that the MRI is required. But if you have 11 degree curve at 6 years, not very progressive, looks like right thoracic idiopathic, you are justified not to do MRI. Alright? When you plan for surgery, you are justified to do MRI to remove any possibility of neurological complications by undergoing disorders. So 20 degrees is usually taken cut off at early onset and congenital also. Okay? Clear? Understood? When will you do MRI? Examiner asks you, tell that these are the things, these are the reasons I will do MRI. When you do CT scan, skeletal abnormalities. What are those? Congenital, any vertebra, then block vertebrae, unsegmented parts, or you want to see a 3D picture of the whole scoliotic curve to plan your surgery, a pedicular assessment. You want to put pedicular screws. So there is a possibility there is a deformation of the pedicles, so you will do a CT scan. So coming to diagnosis to concretize, once you know that this is a type of scoliosis, you also need to have scientific language to communicate. So what are the different ways of to classify scoliosis? What is structural? More than 50 degrees, not flexible, even on bending films not coming less than 25 degrees, that is a structural curve or a major curve. Alright? There could be one or more major curves or structural curves. Alright? Non structural could be compensatory, like sciatic list, or a compensatory curve along with that, that left lumbar, which is becoming less than 20 25 on bending, is a non structural curve. Okay? The etiology, it could be idiopathic, non idiopathic. In non idiopathic, it could be congenital, acquired. In acquired, it could be other things. Along with that, there could be neuromuscular. So, etiology tells you that this could be different, different reasons. What you may see is a parallel scoliosis in CP or polio or Marfan syndrome and others are not so uncommon as well. There are some reasons very extremely uncommon. Now there are scoliosis secondary to surgery, hydrogeny, infection, or even fractures which are unequivocal. That can also give rise to. Or heel cox. Okay? Clear? Yeah, so this is ideological. Now what we need to understand is in idiopathic scoliosis, what are the classifications? Because you will be asked about this. So there are two major classification systems. One is King's and the other one is Lenkin's. What was the first instrumentation used for scoliosis surgery? Anybody? Harrington rods, right? So, all of you are aware what was Harrington rod? There was a hook on the top, hook below, and there was a rod to distract. So, when you use that system, you need to understand certain things about scoliosis. So, there was a system called King classification, which to tell you whether it is appropriate to put Harrington or no, right? Then came the newer system, which are known as the segmental instrumentation system. So, King's classification or Harrington considered scoliosis as a unidimensional deformity, only a coronal curvature. So, you distract, it becomes stable. 
Then we understood that there is a sagittal also, the rotation also. So you need to derotate, you need to restore the sagittal alignment. So then you have something called as lengthy classification. Now what is lengthy classification? All these are subtypes. There are one to six types. There is three curves which I told you. Proximal thoracic, main thoracic, thoracolumbar. So in type one, the main curve is main thoracic, which is structural. Proximal is non-structural, this is non-structural. I'm just giving you one example, let's not go into detail of this. So what it tells you is more detailed way how the scoliosis can be interpreted. There could be one curve or two curves or three curves. It could be thoracic or thoracal lumbar, which is a major curve, or two major curves. Okay? It also tells you what to correct and from what level to what level roughly it gives you an idea. There is something extra called as lumbar modifier. You saw that CSVA. Suppose the lumbar curve is going beyond on one side or the other side, also tells you how far you have to go down when you put screws. So examination, what you need to say is linkage classification, more accepted, tells you in two dimensions, also tells us roughly the guidelines from where to where one has to include. For example, if there are two curves, will you include whole vertebral system, right from D1 to S1, or will you stop somewhere to retain mobility? This is what you need to understand. Clear? Any doubt, any question about it? So these are the criteria for linking. How many curves? What level curves? Which structural, non structural? Lumbar spine modifier, and there is something called as sagittal or thoracic sagittal modifier. It is normal kyphosis, lordosis, or hyperkyphosis. Okay? So if you have a scoliosis case, this is what you need to tell. This is what you already said, most of you, right? Sagittal thoracic. But what it, you have to mention is age, etiology, extent, exact measurement, which side the rotation, is there any other reason? The secondary thoracal lumbar compensatory curve which was there, how many degrees that you have to mention, whether it is compensated scoliosis or uncompensated, with shoulder, both are yet crest, same level, compensated curve. When it is not, it is decompensated or uncompensated curve. Associated with any other problem which is underlined, now, what is the treatment? Age of the patient, sex of the patient. If you tell this, you already passed, but do not go overboard to mention about this. Let the examiner ask you, you can say that these are the guidelines, I'm not so sure. Any questions understand so far? Okay? Now, there are certain prognostic factors, remember this. When somebody asks you, will you operate? Is surgery required? What are the things you need to consider? Age of the patient, sex of the patient, growth potential, which is told, told to you by rises grading and secondary sexual characters, by kindness grading. Type of curve, whether it is congenital, whatever, idiopathic. What is the curve measurement? 40 degrees to start with and 6 year old is going to progress. Rigidity and progression, is if it is there. How much is the rotation and turn imbalance and associated problems, neurology or something. So these are the things you need to understand to judge whether what is required, right? Now, in idiopathic cirrhosis, simple to understand. Up to 20 to 25 degrees, all you need to do is observe the patient. What do you mean by observe the patient? Call the patient every six monthly, repeat that AP X-ray, measure, com compare the top angle. If progression is more than six degrees a year, usually it's a rapidly progressive curve, near surgery if it's going to go beyond certain level, right? But second group is 25 to 40. Okay? There is good growth potential, 25 to 40. What you'll advise the patient? Give that patient, usually the girl, corrective bracing. Most of the time in the day, even at night, three point correction, maximum use. If there are already 40 degrees, good growth potential, advise surgery. Now there are certain things. If the curve is 30 degrees, but a lot of imbalance already, a lot of decompensation, a lot of cosmetic problem, you need not do it. And it may be 42 or 45 degrees, but not at all visible, well compensated, you can do it. So these are not rigid guidelines, these are just simple guidelines to go by. Now, as I told you, it is dose dependent, have to use still schedule maturity. There are various ways, but there is a definite evidence that some of the patients of borderline surgery may be prevented. When it comes to surgery, there are reasons why you do surgery, and the indications change from etiology, idiopathic to neuromuscular to tendonitis. But when it comes to surgery, there are certain things you need to follow. In idiopathic, more than 40 degrees progressive, still an immature patient, you need surgery. Whenever you operate, all primary or structural curves have to be fused. When it comes to secondary curves or secondary structural curves, 
you need to retain mobility also, right? What is very important over here is to understand where the curve is starting and ending. Like here, there are three curves. You need to understand which one is most important. It is the main thoracic. Here it is mild, not tilted, correctable, see the bending pins, and you may not be required to correct it. You can see that this is the main curve. The other one is not. Okay? Now choosing the fusion level as I have told you, based on this. So what are the goals when you come to surgery? Is it that you need to 100% correct every curve, make a very rigid spine, looks very good radiologically, but which is not moving at all, completely immobile? No. What you need to restore is a trunk symmetry, stability of the curve. Why doing this? Maximally correct the curve. Stop the progression by soundly fusing it. That means proper instrumentation, bone grafting, and also have radiological fusion. The restoration of the sagittal contour, proper kyphosis and lordosis, Doing that, maintain as much mobility below as possible and do not jeopardize the respiratory function. That means if the chest is still to grow, child is very young, do not fuse it at that time. <coughs> so this is how you plan. Identify invertebrae, neutral vertebrae, apex, flexibility of the curve, measurement of rib hump, kyphosis, lordosis, associated, how much rotation, how fast progression. And these are just the, this is a very flexible curve, so completely correct. Just you can have static placement, need not put implants everywhere. Right? So most of the idiopathic curves are treated by posterior only surgeries. Unless the curve is set, you know, more than 100 degrees, very rigid, second or third surgery, we do not go anterior because anterior surgery has more chances of morbidity and mortality. Examiner asks you, which surgery? As much as possible, it is going to be posterior. Posterior incision, posterior release, posterior decortication, posterior fixation and fusion. Right? Now, what are the instrumentation used? Most of you will see only the pedicle screws from right from occiput to S1, we will use <coughs> everywhere. But there are implants like hooks or sublaminar wires, sometimes they are used. Okay? This is another case, relatively less mobile and multiple pontis osteotomy better. Pontis osteotomy is a technique where you make every vertebrae mobile, cutting of the lateral structure, the facets and everything. But the technique remains the same, posterior incision, posterior fixation, posterior release and fusion. Now fusion should always, should be going to neutral or you end at any vertebra plus one, you make the vertebrae parallel. So where you stop, it has to be parallel. If you have curved still, it will progress above and below. As much as possible, do not go below L3. If you go below, there is a degeneration of the adjacent disc. So just remember these simple things, that you include the primary structural curve, Stop as much as possible at L3, do not go beyond. Restore the surgical contours. Correct curve as much as possible without causing any damage to the neural structures. Intraoperatively, there is a way. Just example, <coughs> rigid curve. Now, if there is a more than 100 degrees curve, you do anterior surgery first. The release, multiple discectomy, maybe internal costoplasty. Make it mobile, turn her over, and then do posterior fixation. Like in this case, the patient had Response. What could be the diagnosis? <laughs> what are the other stigmata of uh, anything else? What diagnosis you require? How many? Okay. Then there are stigmata in the spine. Tension thinning of the ribs, dural ectasia, osteopenia, osteoporosis. These are type 1, type 2 curves in neurofibromatosis. So these curves require anterior fusion as well. You cannot realize just on posterior implants. So this is an indication for an anterior surgery, which is becoming rarer and rarer. We do it only in certain cases. Now this was all about scoliosis in idiopathic cases or that uh, neurofibromatosis. When it comes to congenital, the criteria are different. You may operate very early. If it is rapidly progressing, you know it's a any whatever is incarcerated with opposite bar. You need to do as early as possible. There are surgeries like any epistodesis, any whatever excision and growth rods. Let's see a few. All of you should remember this. It's basic classification. So this is an example. There's any vertebra. This will keep on growing, go other way. This child was very young, I think, three or four years, but we still had to do surgery, excise it completely, she's doing fine. So in congenital scoliosis, the criteria are different. You need to see frontal and sagittal balance. So if there is 
normal you do posterior only. If there is imbalance, you need to do only posterior, but if it is correctable. If it is not correctable, you may require a rejection of the vertebra and osteotomy in the instrumentation. If it is associated kyphosis, you need to correct that also, either with minute excision or partial correction. And lordosis, if it is there, only anterior. Posterior surgery is not right. So these are definitely different criteria. You need not remember everything. What you remember is in congenital, rapidly progressive. If there is early presentation, do not wait for the child to grow or for surgery. Okay? This was a patient who corrected came late to so complete excision, complete correction. Another hemi vertebra, complete tail inequality of the crest, hemi vertebra excision, complete correction. So there are other procedures for rib hump, for rigid scoliosis, adult presentation, recurrence. So VCR is the most aggressive. When you take it out, it affects one or two vertically. So you have made spine mobile and then you fix and fuse. Early onset scoliosis is the last thing that I am going to tell you. What happens if the patient presents very early? He's five or six years, already he's 40 degrees. Will you offer him correction and fusion? <coughs> what will happen if you fuse at that? What do you mean by two? Limbs are still going to grow. What happens is one mm increase in the height of the thoracic spine results in one cubic mm increased space for the chest. What is the risk? You have a child where you have fused the thoracic spine, limbs are going to grow, body requirement of the cardiovascular sufficiency is going to increase, the chest capacity remains limited. You are creating cardiovascular insufficiency. There is a direct bearing on the patient's life expectancy. Right? So there are various problems for this. There is crankshaft, uh, implant mold is not good, bones are cartilaginous, lot of morbidity, structures are small, the nerves are small. So what you need in this case, this is something we have done very ugly stage, long time back, not very happy about the result. This was anterior surgery, still saved some segments, did well. But now, if anybody comes with a rapidly growing ugly onset scoliosis, what you have to offer is something called as growth rod. What do you do when you have to, uh, let's say a child which requires fixation for a bone and you want to do limb lengthening? Either you do laser out or lengthening with the rods inside, correct? Apply the same principle for spine. So there are rods where every six months or eight months you distract a bit. Or you can do it without opening, called as magic rods, they are magnetic. So just with magnetic pulse, it opens up one or two mm. Okay? So the principle is, now this guy was just four years old, already severe, you can't wait, they're already around 80 degrees. So you just, minimal invasive surgery, you just open distally, proximally, you put these screws here, here, connecting now, you know, and these are subsequent, this is at eight months, maybe one and a half years, now three or four distractions. Already it is partially corrected, the guy has grown by almost five to six inches, we will continue this as much as possible till it's closer to 30, 40 degrees. <coughs> there will be problems, there will be rod breakages, implant cut out, all this, all this, possibly we need to change the rods. Important is, he is going to be having good vital capacity, good chest capacity by the time he achieves skeletal maturity. So, this is about to conclude that in scoliosis surgery, what we use nowadays is all pedicle screw system. Sagittal alignment is equally necessary. I already told you about different kinds of curves. When you actually do the surgery, you can correct the curve by extraction, compression, derotation, something called as vertebral column resection, or there could be cantilever reduction, etc. All these things have excellent results. Only 2% should arthrosis. Most of the long segments they do very well. These are all the parameters that you should follow when you treat scoliosis. Early detection, proper assessment, good follow-up, be vigilant about indication, treatment as per the guidelines, what I have told you, the type of system. Whenever you fuse, stop at L3 or above. non idiopathic whenever possible, go in early. You can handle curves, even at earlier age, you go and fuse. Just remember this algorithm. Up to 20 degrees, observe. 20 to 40 degrees, bracing. No progression, that's all is required. Progressive, then go for surgery. If more than 40 degrees before skeletal maturity, rapidly progressive, cosmetically uncompensated, then most probably posterior surgery fixation. Thank you so much for patience.